Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for attending. This I want to talk to you about um, complexity and convergence um, and patterns we're seeing uh, in terms of the landscape scale effects of forest structure on the intensity and the degree of synchrony in two uh, so-called cyclic uh, forest insects, the spruce butterworm forest tent caterpillar. And the co-authors on the talk are Brian Canoehead Sturdivant, and on the right you see Dan Nishaw and Louis Etienne Robert. And also Bina Thapa was a student who worked on the remote sensing component. And the story starts in Ontario with a paper by Jens Roll in 1993 studying defoliation data of tent caterpillar in the districts of Ontario where there's a lot of forest fragmentation from commercial forestry development. And he showed on the right that you have uh, longer lasting outbreaks, more defoliation in uh, townships that have more forest fragmentation, so a greater degree of uh, edge of forest per kilometer squared of forest. He subsequently went to Alberta and in this 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer gridded area east of Edmonton, he studied uh, 128 forest tent caterpillar populations across this forested landscape. The dark gray in the top left is the forest and you could see on the east and west ends of the study area, it's a little more fragmented forest with open hay fields and, and suburban encroachment and uh, a lot of lakes. And what he showed uh, in his 2005 paper is that when you measure, you estimate parameters A1 and A2 from population data over a 12 year period, uh, you get a higher intensity, uh, so greater amplitude and lower frequency cycling in that continuous forest down the central north south axis. And you get low amplitude, high frequency population cycling on either side uh, of the study area but this was based on a single population cycle. And so he and I had a wager about what you would get if you were to study tree ring data over the past 100 years in this study area on all 128 sites. And foolish me, I took the bet and started a PhD looking at the tree ring, uh, tree ring behavior across this uh, study area. And so uh, the first part of this talk is about these data and then how that relates to uh, what's going on in the bigger boreal. And what we saw in that study area is uh, this is the uh, a chronology of mean aspen ring widths across the uh, 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 80 years. And the black line is are the mean ring widths. And uh, you can see that there's quasi periodic growth reductions. And sometimes these are intense. And sometimes they're, they're slightly less intense. In fact, the, the dips are bimodally distributed, frequently uh, hitting the modes of 0 0.55 millimeters and more commonly hitting a mode of 0.75 millimeters. And also illustrated as a horizontal line here is 0.65 millimeters, which in Minnesota, when an aspen ring width gets down to that uh, width, it typically implies 100% defoliation by forest tent caterpillar. Uh, so the, there are 11 intervals that you can define where there's a, a growth reduction. So these are gro 11 growth reduction intervals. And the top squares indicate how much synchrony there is within each interval. And the average amount of synchrony across intervals is 0 0.45. That's where the RT equals plus 0 0.45. So these fluctuations are really synchronous across that 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer area. And the thing that's weird, uh, completely unexpected, and this is you know, getting back to the wager between Jens and I, the wager was, uh, he, he thought that there would be different, different uh, cycling behavior in the different landscape types. And I thought that dispersal was sufficient between subpopulations that it would all be synchronized out. And so it looked like uh, in the time domain that I'm right, all, all of the variation is synchronizing out, but he's half right and I was, I was half wrong. Because if you look at the circles, the circles indicate how much correlation there is between uh, growth reduction maps between intervals. And the mean uh, spatial correlation between intervals is minus 0.45. So to be clear, there's a lot of synchrony in time, but spatially, this process could be considered asynchronous. To use clearer language, we're talking about a high degree of phase coherence and a high degree of amplitude decoherence as this disturbance process pulses about the landscape in a systematic manner. This is a spatial map of those growth reductions, the red being a small uh, ring that is uh, about 0.33 millimeters, and the blue colors are more like 1.58 millimeters. 
which is uh, quite a lot of growth. And so as you go between interval, interval to interval, the spatial pattern is moving about in a highly systematic manner where one growth reduction map tends to be negatively correlated with the next one. And this is a plot of the ground level forest data from each of those 128 plots where blue is heavy forest along that north-south axis and then the red is less forest cover on the eastern and western ends of the study area. And what you see is that when you compare the interval uh, spatial impact of the, you know, the growth reduction to the forest cover, the correlation averages zero, but there are actually no zero correlations because the correlations are bimodally distributed. Half of them are negative and half of them are positive. So this means that the, uh, the growth reduction is skipping around in, in, in the continuous forest. And then the next episode is in the fragmented forest. The next one will be in the continuous forest. And the spatial pattern alternates successively between uh, uh, locations on the study area. Another important observation is how the, uh, the troughs, there's greater degree of synchrony the deeper the trough, which is unusual. So all of that stuff was known back in 2001 when I did my dissertation. And when we started the Border Lakes project in 2005 and got the field data in 2007. This is the Border Lakes uh, study area in uh, the border of Minnesota and Ontario. And it's got up in the north part is a coarse scale harvest uh, patterns. And down in Minnesota, it's a finer scale of harvest pattern. And in the central area, which includes Quetico Provincial Park and the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, it's largely undisturbed since the harvesting of big pines in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. So there is a landscape gradient of structure there to be investigated. And so we did the same thing with uh, tree ring reconstructions, this time, not just with, with uh, aspen, but also with spruce, with the idea of reconstructing aspen, uh, uh, forest tent caterpillar outbreaks on aspen and spruce bottom outbreaks on spruce. And so these are the 16, uh, we call them sub areas that were uh, sampled in Ontario, the wilderness area and in Minnesota. And this was done by Louis Chen Robert and, and a team of seven other people paddling around the um, study area. And the idea was that uh, based on the dissertation research, we thought that host tree distribution should affect outbreak dynamics according to two possibilities. If the host tree distributions are affecting uh, the herbivores, it could impact their dispersal success, which should influence cycle synchrony and the degree of eruptive spread. And if it's affecting natural enemies, which was shown in Jens's work, it should also affect cycle amplitude and cycle frequency. So in summary, we thought that more host trees would lead to higher amplitude uh, more synchronous cycling. And Louis Etienne published two papers that were well received. The spruce budworm paper in 2018 went to ecography and the forest tent caterpillar paper in 2020 went to ecosphere. And both show using an idi idiosyncratic approach to the analyses that indeed uh, host forest cover in, it, it, it improves the intensity and the periodicity and the synchrony of these outbreaks. So you, you wanna go read those papers for sure. I wanna highlight a single simple result from uh, these two papers. This is a plot of the degree of spatial covariance as a function of distance for spruce budworm in the three cover air areas. So spruce budworm is uh, cycling synchronously when the curve is high. So in the, in the wilderness area in green, spruce budworm is uh, quite synchronous at all distances from short distances of zero uh, meters to 80,000 80, meters or uh, 80 kilometers. In Minnesota, where it's more mixed aspen and a more edgy landscape, uh, spruce budworm follows the red curve. There's less synchrony at close distances and there's even less synchrony at large distances. And Ontario is somewhere in the middle for spruce budworm. That's right from the 2018 paper. And if I overlay the curves for tank caterpillar from the 2020 paper, it's the opposite pattern. So you'll see green and red change positions with the dotted curves for tent caterpillar. So tent caterpillar is cycling most synchronously in Minnesota where it's mixed aspen and edgy and it's cycling least synchronously in the wilderness area in green, dotted green curve on the bottom uh, where it's conifer dominated. And again, Ontario is about in the middle somewhere. So if I can summarize those results by showing you the remote sensing data, the area where spruce butterum is uh, cycling most synchronously is this area where that's uh, yellow, red, orange. Um, 
uh, up in Ontario in the wilderness area to the top right of this map. And if I show you the Aspen, in contrast, the Aspen is mostly around the perimeter to the south and to the west. So butterworm is cycling here up in the north and the east, and ten caterpillar cycling most synchronously down here south and the west and the uh, and the west. So the patterns of spatial synchronization are very different in the two insects in the same landscape where the insects are co-located. Now, the there are other details embedded in those two papers that are coming out shortly, but I can tell you that all of the patterns that I described for Alberta we see in these data as well in tent caterpillar. And these are re reconstructed outbreaks now, not just uh, defoliation data and not just aspen ringwits or spruce ringwits. For spruce butterworm on the top, you have six cycles. The amplitude varies uh, tremendously. In fact, the distribution of cycle peaks is bimodal, just as it was with aspen ringwits. You either have low intensity cycles or high intensity cycles. And on the top right, you see what the graph would look like for uh, a normal distribution of cycle intensities. Uh, you would have a lot of uh, areas where you're getting 40%, 60% of the force being affected, but you don't. You see that it, the peaks are around 30% and 70%. So the distribution of cycle peaks is bimodal, big or little. Next, the degree of synchrony uh, is correlated with the degree of cycle intensity. And it's not, by no means uh, uh, an obvious thing that you would expect, but it does happen. The more intense the cycles, the more synchronous they are. And for the tank caterpillar in the bottom half of the figure, it's the same thing. Now you've got 10 cycles over the 100 and uh, so years, and um, they're also bimodally distributed. A, a large portion of these cycles are low intensity events where you're getting only 5, 10, 15% of the trees are affected. So these are very low intensity cycles uh, where the defoliation area wide is far less than 50% and not even detectable by aerial sketch mappers. And as with the spruce butterworm system, you're getting a, a strong degree of uh, uh, synchrony in, with the high intensity impacts and very low synchrony with the low intensity cycles. So it's exactly the same as we saw in Alberta where we're just looking at raw ring widths unprocessed. And if we also look at the spatial distribution of impacts within each interval, you can see the spruce budworm in the top interval, it's starting in the south uh, west of the study area, and the, the rest of the study area is largely not affected, blue. And in the next outbreak cycle, you get, it's a little bit light overall. You can see the yellow, there's a few spots of moderate intensity, but bl still blue, and therefore not much intensity in the northeast part of the study area. And then in the third cycle, 1975 to 2005, which is the most recent cycle that we hear get talked about a lot, um, it, the pattern is high intensity impacts in the Northeast and lower now in the Southwest. So the spatial correlation between successive outbreaks is minus 0.34. So this bucks the conventional wisdom that whatever happened in the last outbreak, you're likely to get in this outbreak. And it's the same pattern for forest tent caterpillar. The degree of spatial correlation between successive uh, intervals spatially is minus 0.35 on average. So the outbreak, the last outbreak doesn't look like the next outbreak at all. They're negatively correlated. Again, that, that bucks conventional wisdom. And so to summarize, whether you're looking at uh, detrended aspen ringlets in Alberta, or whether you're looking at outbreak reconstructions in Ontario and Minnesota, you've got different data streams, different species, different regions of Canada, all showing the same patterns. And these patterns are inconsistent with popular notions of forest insect cycling. First, the distribution of cycle peak intensities is bimodal. It's not unimodal. Uh, the pattern is that the spatial pattern of the last outbreak is a very poor predictor. It's the worst possible predictor, in fact, of the next outbreak. Finally, uh, there are decorrelations in cycling behavior that are consistently driven by forest landscape structure. And so the notion uh, that uh, these insects cycle synchronously is simply wrong. And if I have a simple take home message, it's from these aging rock stars of the 70s, Aldo Nova and John Spence, free your mind. When you're looking at space time data, open your eyes to what the data are telling you. Things aren't always as simple as they seem on the surface.
Uh, yeah, so my name is Hiro Sato, and I'll be pre presenting some of the research I've been doing with the, uh, Dr. Stephen Mayer in the Terrestrial Systems Ecology Research Program. Uh, it was really interesting to hear from Barry. Um, there's some overlap already going in my mind, but uh, I'll kind of think about that, about that later. So my approach to budworm is actually from the perspective of an Earth systems modeler. Uh, so my background is in dynamic global vegetation modeling, um, which are mostly process-based, and they're used to simulate the impacts of climate change on terrestrial ecosystems and to also reconstruct ecosystems of the past. Um, and these models are frequently used by, like, say, the IPCC to project the impacts of climate change on the terrestrial biosphere. Um, but they are global scale, and they tend to be very coarse. So my, and my initial motivation really, really was not to simulate budworms specifically, but to project ecosystems into the future. Um, however, as you know, as you all know, um, you know, if you're working in Eastern Canada, Eastern Canadian boreal forest, you can't really uh, have one without the other. Uh, so what are the projections saying? So the effects of climate change are projected to increase, you know, in all regions all over the planet over the next few decades, more heat, more variable precipitation in all regions. Um, but under all the projection scenarios, the poles, particularly the Arctic, will experience more intense temperature increases. Um, and this polar amplification will drive faster changes in climate in northern, re northern regions, including much of Canada and Ontario. And according to the Whitaker, Whitaker plot on the bottom right, uh, you assume there's sort of this one-to-one -one relationship between uh, biomes and climate, which is, you know, the most basic understanding of uh, atmosphere-biosphere uh, relationships, but still very important. So as climate shifts, there's going to be these redistribution of biomes, uh, and in our case, there's probably going to be this migration of boreal forests to the north with more open ecosystems or temperate-type uh, systems in the south. Um, so how and when and, nature of these sh and the nature of these shifts is really into question, the complexity of it. Um, and climate, uh, from the climate models, is really essential to predicting the future, but there are other factors. Um, soil matters, CO2 fertilization matters, and disturbance really matters. And fires really got a lot of attention in the last, um, I mean, decades uh, in the modeling world and these models specifically, but there's been a lot less effort towards biotic disturbance. And this leads us to the eastern spruce budworm, um, you know, a major source of disturbance in eastern Canada. So it's a host-specific defoliator that preferentially feeds on balsam fir as well as spruce species uh, with outbreaks, you know, 30 to 40 years. Um, and at this point, uh, and the point is to me that even if you know climate, even if you know fire regimes into the future, you may not simulate uh, eastern boreal forest without knowing budworm, uh, at least to some degree. So it's necessary to know it to forecast systems into the future or to improve our forecasts. So our goal was to integrate spruce budworm in some way to this large dynamic uh, model, which is currently used in uh, tandem with climate change models. So the model we're working with is called LPJ LM Fire. Um, Let's see, did I miss a picture? Oh no, good. Um, which is one of the major dynamic global vegetation models. So climate drives it, um, biological or uh, biophysical and physiological processes are calculated, uh, such as photosynthesis, respiration, transpiration. Um, and we have four PFTs um, in our case at the genus level, pine, spruce, fir, and poplar. And essentially solar radiation comes in uh, climate dictates productivity and carbon uptake by PFTs, which is allocated to roots, um, foliage, and wood for growth. Uh, trees can die from a range of processes, a uh, range of causes, including heat stress or negative carbon balance, uh, fire damage. Uh, we have our budworm module coming in. So we start with a small amount of hibernating L2, L2O larva. Uh, mass progresses through these life stages based on developmental rates, namely driven by temperature. Um, and larvae consume foliage as a function of temperature and life stage. And females lay eggs with some linear dependence on temperature. Um, and the bottom right slide shows a sample of how much foliage uh, we modeled is consumed uh, by budworm larvae as they pr progress through L2 to the L6 stages. And uh, you know, the majority of the consumption takes place in the uh, later stages. So the major, the early question was, you know, how to trigger the initial presence of budworm. This is a very complex thing in reality. Um, you know, it's, you know, the origins of outbreak is uh, still hotly debated. Um, so how do we determine where they appear? And we chose something very simple. We decided a small colony of budworm would appear if a certain amount of uh, fur foliage was present. Um, so we created a parameter called the leaf mass thresher, threshold, or LMT, um, which is the minimum mass density of fur foliage required to trigger budworm. Um, but now you introduce this new parameter, this LMT, um, and 
you know, how do you determine how much foliage is there to trigger outbreak? And what you do in this kind of case is you run a, a sensitivity test or you run a, a series of a series of model runs for different thresholds. So this is the direct model output showing the amount of fur foliage consumed for different values of LMT. Um, so from top to bottom, left to right, uh, you start with a very low uh, threshold to a very high threshold. Um, and, you know, as expected, you get very broad patterns at a low leaf mass threshold. So there's budworm anywhere, there's, there's fur, even a little fur. And you get very narrow patterns at a high threshold. So you get budworm only where there's very dense fur. And it's noteworthy here that the fur densities were generated from bare ground, um, which means that, yeah, you didn't, you, we didn't know where they were. You just start from the ecophysiology of the host trees, climate, and through growth and competition, you get the distribution of trees. Um, so you're, you're, you're generating uh, both the host species and this postulated budworm uh, defoliation from, from scratch. And this is important because in the, you know, for future projections, you need to do this because the, the fur distributions will change. Um, so I found Canada-wide data from consolidated aerial sketch maps by Dr. Grain and Wayne McKinnon from the CFS. And, you know, we started to see some general overlap. Um, and we got data from uh, Wayne McKinnon, Dr. Gray retired. And visual comparison is nice, but, you know, we had to figure out a way to compare the two maps more quantitatively. Um, so we converted both model and data to binary, showing a outbreak class for now, just doing the simplest, uh, you know, defoliated or not defoliated. Um, for 1941 to 1998, as observed by ASM data. And on the bottom left, you see where our model predicted budworm to defoliate. Um, and the top left is the McKinnon data, random McKinnon data. Um, the bottom right shows in purple where we predicted a defoliation, but was not observed in ASM data. Uh, in green, it's where ASM data show defoliation, but the model did not predict. And the top right is, yeah, the intersection. So we, we got it right. Um, so we did this for all nine cases to calculate what is known as a Jackard coefficient, which is a measure of not only of, uh, it's a measure of spatial similarity. So not only of model agreement, but also disagreement. We did this for all nine runs to just get some sort of physical basis for a leaf mass threshold. Um, and we performed better than a random model in most of these cases. And a lot of the, some of the area that we predicted that wasn't observed by ASM data, we, we believe to be, just lack of uh, survey. So in the northern regions of Quebec, for example, and some of the East Coast. Um, so there really may have been budworm there, but it just wasn't recorded by ASM data. So maybe our scores are better than we, uh, than, than we think right now. And I'm actually kind of curious if there's an actual physical foliage density threshold, because this was just put as a model mechanism, but now I'm kind of curious if there's an actual physical foliage density threshold that could be estimated through more direct methods. Um, so outbreak maybe not be hard triggered, um, by this foliage density. Um, and there's a lot of complexity, of course, as Barry, Barry was talking about, but there could be some kind of probabilistic relationship sensitive in a certain range of uh, host foliage density values. Um, maybe there's work on that already and let me know if there is because it could be very useful to me. Um, in terms of temporal dynamics, you know, fur grows to a certain, certain threshold, butter appears, consumes the fur till it depletes. Um, at, this, at which point the budworm larvae uh, die off, fur starts to regenerate, and we see the cyclicity associated with budworm. Um, and in the model, uh, the return interval is determined by the leaf mass threshold and the regeneration rate of balsam fir. Uh, and however, however, in reality, uh, it's very likely that you know, dispersal parasites, predation, other ecological factors have strong, some strong influence on the observed um, 30 to 40 year outbreak cycle. Um, but I found it interesting in our study how this bottom up control um, could really link spatial and temporal patterns. Um, and how they're both intimately linked to the physiology of balsam fir, which the dynamic vegetation model is built for, uh, simulating trees over large scales. Uh, so they got it, to get budworm right, you should get fir right, um, at least for predictive context. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in budworm because of its hypothesized influence on fire. Um, so there's been some major fires that have occurred subsequent to spruce budworm outbreaks, um, including the 1825 Miramichi fire, New Brunswick. Um, so it's been an important question for a while, as most of you know, and, you know, with climate change, increased fire risk in present and future contexts, we wanted to address it. And I guess the most imp one of the most important uh, papers, it seems, is Stocks in 1987, who used a controlled burn experiment, um, finding that fire potential to be uh, significantly, significantly higher at five to eight years after mortality. 
Um, so here's some picture of the, pictures of the explosive spring fires post outbreak. Uh, so he believed, he, he concluded that fire potential is enhanced by uh, defoliation. Um, however, I read modeling studies more recently that showed uh, by, by Sturdivant, et cetera, that showed a more, a smaller um, enhancement over longer time, uh, temporal and spatial scales. So I was curious to why you get, you know, this uh, clear, sig clear kind of evidence that uh, mortality, budworm induced mortality could enhance fire, but you, over long scales, yeah, may not be the case. Um, okay, so in this, this is our model. Um, it showed the impact of budworm on fire through a uh, burn fraction and slow litter prior to and during and after an outbreak. So blue is before, pink is during, green is after. And there is enhancement of fire after defoliation and death of host trees, which is driven by a sudden rise in slow fuel uh, following defoliation induced mortality. Um, so this increases fuel, bulk fuel density, making ignition and rate of spread higher. But the increase in burn area is then followed by a decrease relative in control, uh, relative to control, uh, reflecting a depletion of fuel after an initial period of larger fires. So you do get bigger fires out of an outbreak after an outbreak. Uh, due to increased mortality of host trees and fuel loads, but this is balanced in part by a diminished period. So this is what we're seeing. Um, so it alters fuel dynamics that may not alter the long term. If you average over time uh, and space, it may not be that large of an effect, like maybe one to two percent. And we found that this interaction of budworm and fire uh, potentially varies across the eastern boreal um, with higher levels of enhancement in the west, uh, which could be attributed to the drier climate. Um, leading to more flam flam fuel loads. Um, so in terms of the so from, uh, from the Earth system uh, modeling point of view, I believe we made strong progress uh, towards integrating spruce budworm and biotic disturbance, you know, to a dynamic vegetation model. Um, one of the keys to this was implementing a bottom-up control of host foliage to determine spatial and temporal patterns, uh, which I think there's some physicality to be explored. Uh, and I'd love to talk about it with someone here. Um, and we also simulated the some of the fuel and fire dynamics as observed by stocks. Um, and, you know, consistency with other uh, modeling studies at larger scales, um, as well as predicting the spatial variation of interaction strengths. And, you know, the motivation for this was we're supposed to project into the future. Um, and as a predictive model, I think we've made some uh, good strides. So... I talked a little fast. I wanted to stay within the 12 minute period, um, but I just wanted to say thank you to Stephen Mayer, our program lead, um, Jean Noel Kandao, and Martin Girardin at the CFS, uh, Great Lakes and Laurentian, respectively, Emmeline Chase, who, did a lot, um, who I co authored this uh, work with, uh, Christelle Halley, and Jed Kaplan, Jed Kaplan at the um, University of Hong Kong, uh, who's um, you know, leading a climate change impacts modeler. Um, so these are my collaborators, and thank you very, very much for listening. So, hi everyone, um, I'm Morgan and I'm uh, very happy uh, to be here today to share with you some of the work uh, I've been doing for my PhD thesis uh, at uh, McGill and also supervised by uh, Patrick in University of Toronto. So forests around the globe, as peaceful as they can seem for the untrained eyes, are actually dealing every day with potential enemies. But most of you, if not all, are forest disturbance experts and you are well aware that forest disturbances are playing an important role in shaping the forests uh, as we know them. In Canada, the areas impacted annually by different disturbances are represented uh, on this graph by the bars. Light and dark green at the top represent the surface disturbed by forestry. Dark pink uh, at the bottom is the surface impacted by fire. And orange is insects. So it's very clear from this graph that outbreaks of insects are the main disturbance of Canadian forests, and they result in important economic losses and massive carbon releases in the atmosphere. In Canada, the most emerging species of all is the spruce budworm. The spruce budworm is a species of moth native to eastern Canada and USA. The larvae feeds mainly on spruce and palsam fir, and females lay, uh, have one brood per year. This species is fascinating because it displays an incredible cyclic dynamics. Every 30 or 40 years, the population numbers increase dramatically, triggering the start of devastating outbreaks. The larvae are responsible for large-scale uh, defoliation events, as you can see an example on the photo here. The area affected uh, will vary between outbreaks. So will the damage and host tree mortality. On the map here, 
uh, we can see the frequency of defoliation caused by spruce budworm between 1954 and 1988. Outbreaking species such as the spruce budworm can exist in two stages. So we have the endemic phase, which is the period between two outbreaks uh, when the densities are low and outbreaking. An outbreak can further be divided in three different stages, the onset or the rising phase, the peak and the collapse. The, so the collapse is when the population densities crash and go back to endemic level. The rising phase of an outbreak is particularly interesting and challenging to study for a number of different reasons. The visible defoliation, which is a commonly used metric to monitor outbreaks, appears sometimes after local population already switched to epidemic densities. Furthermore, it is very labor intensive to sample larvae during a low density period, and the surface where an outbreak can start is enormous. An outbreak can be described as a whole, uh, as it is the case on this figure, but it is also very important to understand the finer scale spatial variation. In general, potential drivers uh, can be classified in two groups. Bottom up, which is very, uh, everything related to quality and availability of the host, uh, and top down, which include the effect of natural enemies such as predators and parasitoids. The ultimate goal is to be able to predict when and where an outbreak will start and how it will develop in order to take mitigation measures. Although the spruce bedworm system has been studied for decades, their outbreaks are still very challenging to understand. Uh, for my PhD, I'm trying to develop models that could improve our ability to predict uh, the risk of uh, increasing spruce bedworm densities and therefore the risk of defoliation. So in this presentation, uh, I'm going to focus on two different questions. So the first one, how do environmental conditions impact the development of an outbreak? And the second one, how do larvae densities and defoliation relate to one another? Previous studies have looked at what drivers influence the development of an outbreak, such as Bouchard and Loger in 2014. They used defoliation as their response variable and found that elevation was the main factor explaining the location of initial epicenters and that other predictors such as forest composition or temperature were not as influential. The approach presented here uh, is, uh, is different uh, because I have the chance of working with time series of spruce bedworm larvae densities, which allow us to investigate the effect of environmental, uh, of, of, of environment, sorry, uh, on the fine scale population dynamics directly. In addition, linking these population data with the commonly used defoliation maps could improve our ability to predict where defoliation events are likely to occur. My study area is Quebec, as it has historically been the most affected province by spruce bedworm outbreak. So a lot of effort and resources have been put into consistently monitoring spruce bedworm population. So on this animation here, you can see the evolution of spruce bedworm densities throughout Quebec uh, between 2001 and 2018 during the ongoing outbreak. The densities here are expressed as number of larvae per branch, uh, and this data set contains information in more than a thousand different sites, with most of them reaching epidemic densities at some point. Uh, what is also very interesting with, it, with this data set is that it contains observation before the outbreak started in 2006. Can live until 2018 and then change our site. <laughs> so my first objective was to estimate the population trends or growth rate uh, for the time for time series that contained uh, for at, uh, that contained data. Sorry, for at least 10 years. To do so, I used the state space modeling approach that allowed me to account for some of the observation error and missing data. In a second step, I linked this estimated growth rate with environmental conditions. Uh, data that I retrieved from the Quebec forest inventories. So on this map, we can see the estimated growth rate at each location, with higher value meaning a faster growth, negative value a decrease, and zero meaning no growth. What is striking is what seems to be a clear differentiation between the south of the province and the north, with the north having higher growth rates, so a faster increase in population density. But let's look at the result of the regression uh, to see what's really happening. So the best regression model uh, after selection contained the slope, the proportion of black spruce, the elevation, the proportion of hardwood species, the latitude, and an interaction term between latitude and black spruce. 
As suspected from looking at the graph, latitude was the most influential predictor. Of course, latitude is really a proxy for a suite of other environmental conditions that weren't explicitly included in the model, such as maybe temperature. The second, thing that, the second thing that caught my attention was hardwood proportion. So hardwood are not host species of spruce budworm, but they are very important for related parasitoids. This result, this result tell us that population growth rate and hardwood proportion have a positive relationship, which is the opposite to what I was expecting given the literature. So I investigated this relationship a bit more and found that in the absence of latitude in the model, the relationship was as expected, it was negative. So this seems to suggest that perhaps the relationship is due to some other factors that are related to latitude. The other predictors had only minor effects with less than 1% of the variance explained. Sorry, change my slide too fast. <laughs> so now that I had a better idea of the population trends during the rising phase of the current outbreak in Quebec, I was curious as to how spruce budworm densities and environmental conditions relate to observed defoliation. When you think about it, Defoliation might not become visible immediately after population switch to epidemic level. And if a time lag exists and that we can estimate it, then we might be able to have earlier prediction of areas at risk uh, than by using defoliation maps alone. So the maps of defoliation uh, caused by spruce bedworm are produced annually in Quebec. And in combination with the population that data I already have, uh, I already presented, sorry, I was able to determine what I call the best time lag uh, between increasing spruce bedworm densities and observed defoliation. So very briefly, I compared models with different lags. So I took defoliation and explained them by the spruce bedworm densities of the previous year, of two years before, of three years before, or any combination of years. And once this best lag was established, I included the environmental variables in a mixed effect model to in investigate the impact of both the environment and the insect densities on defoliation. So after selection, I found that the best time lag to explain defoliation was to take the spruce budworm densities of the three years prior defoliation. So I created a new variable including the cumulative densities of one, two and three years before the defoliation was observed. The graph on the right shows the importance of predictors when I included all the environmental conditions in the model. So not surprisingly, the density of spruce budworm accounted for the majority of the variance explained by the model. The two other significant uh, predictors were balsam fir and black spruce proportions. Balsam fir had a positive relationship with defoliation. So for a given density of spruce budworm, a higher proportion of balsam fir would result in a higher probability to observe defoliation. The, the opposite relationship, uh, sorry, the, on the contrary, black spruce had a negative relationship. So for a given density of spruce budworm again, a higher proportion of black spruce would result in a lower probability of observing defoliation. This opposite relationship can be explained by the phenology of these species. Black spruce, but sometime uh, after balsam fir, and balsam fir is, a more is more synchronized with spruce budworm larvae emergence from overwintering. These results are consistent with what is found in the literature, and it means that depending on the local environmental conditions, the risk of defoliation will be different, and therefore it leaves the possibility to have um, targeted monitoring and mitigation efforts. The time series of larvae densities I presented here are, I think, a great source of information to study the rising phase of an outbreak and improve our predictive abilities. Here, we identified meaningful spatial variation following a latitudinal gradient in population growth rates during the ongoing outbreak in Quebec. One of my next steps regarding this is to further investigate this gradient and also its relationship to the surprising effect of hardwood proportion on popula uh, population growth rates. Looking at how population densities influence observed defoliation allowed us to identify a three years time lag uh, and the importance of forest structure in this relationship. My next step is to work uh, on determining how early we can uh, predict defoliation risk using population data. I'm hoping that these models could be used to inform decision support system regarding spruce bedworm outbreaks in Quebec, but also maybe generalize them to other affected province and or uh, outbreaking species. Thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any question.
So uh, hi everyone, my name is Frank. As Amanda said, I uh, work at U of T with Patrick James. And today I'm gonna to present some of the work we've been doing with uh, Spruce Budworm. Along this presentation today, I'm gonna to try to answer a very simple question, which is how far do Spruce Budworm moth disperse? The issue is that the answer is not that easy. Spruce Budworm, we've had a few talks already. Uh, we're interested in that species because it's the most significant outbreaking species currently in Canada. It's been outbreaking since about 2006 in northern Quebec and uh, until now has uh, affected more than 8 million, 8 million hectares in eastern Canada. It's been, uh, um, it's had a ne negative impact in timber production and also has been associated with increased risk in fire, which makes it a species of interest for us. Why do we care about its dispersal? Well, dispersal in uh, outbreaking species, especially, uh, plays a key role in the dynamic and can shift populations from endemic to outbreaking, as uh, showed by previous presentations again. The issue is that when it's working with such a small insect, it's still quite difficult to quantify. If we're able to uh, really quantify that precisely, we'd be able to uh, devise effect effective monitoring methods and early detection tools, which would be uh, then could be then used to inform early intervention strategies. If we improve uh, the detection of hotspots, spots where we know that the populations are rising and might uh, spill out into the rest of the landscape, we'd be able to uh, deploy adaptive measures earlier thus uh, reducing the risk of regional outbreaks. This question has been about dispersal in spruce birdworm has been on everyone's mind for a long time and a lot of other approaches exist and have tried to answer that. Uh, some direct approaches by observation like in for example the 1980s with Greenbank's study where he looked at um, aerial trapping to follow uh, individuals. More recently there was a study using weather data and satellites to actually follow a cloud of migrating adult moths uh, during an event. There are other methods which are more indirect, looking at uh, egg to moth ratio, for example, or comparing captured trap captures uh, with phenological data. And even other uh, approaches, like some in, in, uh, in actually Patrick's lab, where they looked at population genetics and uh, how to uh, quantify the role of timing and sorry, to quantify the role and timing of dispersal in outbreak dynamics using genetics in spruce budworm. Today, the approach I want to present to you is an approach that tries to be a bit slim, simpler in the, with the idea that if it's simpler, we could potentially apply to other species and not just spruce budworm. It relies on trying to use phenology of the species to determine the origin of uh, captured flying adults. So which flying adults? If you look at, at a location and you use phenology, you're able to predict based on environmental conditions where you would have a maximum abundance of individuals. And we could, could then define what we call in this study phenological synchrony, which is the period of time where you expect to have adults present at a given location. So if we get to capture flying adults in that location, we can expect them to be locals, which means they come from there. And that would make sense. In our case, we're more interested in what happens if we go and sample individuals, find them at a time where they're not supposed to be phenologically. If they're not supposed to be from there, they must come from somewhere. So the question is where exactly from and how far did they travel to get there? To try to answer that, we uh, paired then phenology with uh, actual adult moth migrants that were collected across a network of, in a, in a, can I, of sorry, a network of traps in Canada. Uh, phenology is mainly here used uh, as a way to uh, determine the potential origins of those individuals. And we paired that with recorded presence, which were actually samples collected. Um, to determine the potential origin using phenology, we used the biosim, which is a tool that allows to predict the abundance of spruce budworm using environmental data. And we add a network of traps where we have the location and date of presence of adults outside of synchrony. We pair them together, and for each trap where uh, sample adults were sampled outside of synchrony, we look at the date and match that to potential origins according to biosim. Once we have that, we measure distances from origin 
to the sample. What does it look like? What well, it looks like this. In light green, you have potential origins as a biosim uh, would have uh, predicted them to be. In red, our sample, and we measure all the distances from all potential origins on the day of sampling from the origin to the sample. And then we select the nearest one and we consider that the nearest one would be the most probable travel distance. Once we've done that, we do it for all the samples in our field study or any field study. And the final goal would be then to generate dispersal kernels. Dispersal kernels being the probability that a sample individual has traveled a given distance. So we went from our concept to actually apply it to the field. And with, uh, what we did is we sampled 24 sites in Northern Quebec in the currently outbreaking area. In light green, we have the defoliation as of 2014, and in the dots are the different sites. We sample them from 2012 to 2014, and we sample them at least twice during the summer. Twice at very specific dates. If you remember what I showed you earlier, earlier with migrants and locals, we focused on migrants. So we sampled before phenological synchrony and after phenological synchrony. And we paired those two to do our analysis. To give you an example of what it looks like in using our analysis, here is what happens when you have before synchrony. In red is our sample, in gray is the potential area of origin, and in dotted lines, all the distances from those origins to the sample, we collected them and used them further on in the analysis. Here is what it looks like after synchrony. As you can see, I can see the gray area moved from the southwest uh, to the northeast following uh, environmental conditions. We pair them together for each sample. We use that for all sites and all years. Some results now. Uh, all in all, we were able to have uh, 65 sampling events, 28 of them before phenological synchrony, 37 after phenological synchrony. For your information, it's about 8,000 uh, flying uh, migrants that were uh, collected during our study. Now, what it what does it look like? Were we able to generate a dispersal kernel? Well, well, yes, we did, and it looked like this. As you can see in this kernel, uh, most uh, people, most people, sorry, most adult moths that were uh, captured, most probably travel about 50K um, from their origin to the place they were sampled at, and some of were able to potentially travel up to 600 kilometers. Those numbers actually match what has been observed before which means that uh, it, it is possible to characterize insect dispersal using the phenology and re uh, some relati relatively simple data, which is a uh, presence of flight um, capable individuals. What are our next steps now? Well, we're still looking at the sensitivity of the method, uh, depending, on, depending on how close to the period of phen phenological synchrony you sample, there is an effect of that time period. Um, also, we've run the models at different, uh, with different resources. It is possible using Biosim to run the same models for uh, Belden fir as the main resource, but also spruce species as the main resource. And those models show overall the same results, but slight differences. And finally, we've been testing different scales from large multi-provincial scales to uh, much closer um, scales like for example, what I showed today, just defoliation as, to, as of 2014. We also planning to work with the Budworm Tracker program, which is a science, uh, citizen science project. Uh, they have a wider uh, area covered in their project with uh, locations in Bain Saint Laurent, New Brunswick, Cotonou, and Quebec. All in all, they, are, they have 97 sampling sites and they sample them every one to two weeks for, five, for at least five to six years which means a finer uh, ge um, geographic scale, but also a finer time scale. And finally, we'd like to, at some point, uh, apply our model to uh, other outbreaking species. It works with spruce birdworm, and we'd like to now potentially test it against other species in other uh, systems, systems where outbreaking species represent a risk. And our model will then allow um, to maybe inform management to make better decisions in how to uh, reduce risk in those places. I'd like to thank you first for your attention and 
people in my lab as well as our partners. And I'll be happy now to take any question. Thank you. So thanks very much. And I really appreciate the presentations that have come before. They're introducing a couple of the concepts that we'll be looking at here, especially uh, having to do with dispersal distance. And so the project that I've been working on uh, for the past few years with the uh, US and Canadian Forest Services, uh, we're looking at weather-driven dispersal events um, at the scale of single events. Uh, and now just uh, starting to scale up to full seasons. And I'll show a couple of results from that near the end here. Um, so uh, one thing that came up in a paper uh, that we just published in January uh, describing the model that we're using uh, is that uh, males and females, uh, when they disperse uh, through a weather-driven event, totally end up in different places. Uh, and so the idea is uh, we want to investigate how their roles uh, would go on in the further development of that particular season uh, for an outbreak area uh, and how that might lead to the development of new outbreak areas. So you see here my uh, colleagues Jacques and Jan at the Canadian Forest Service. Uh, and Brian Sturdivant at the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, and great deal of thanks to uh, the University of Wisconsin, uh, the Center for High Throughput Computing, and a lot of our uh, simulations are run on the Open Science Grid, uh, which is mostly North America and now global. So you can see here, uh, this is a multidisciplinary project. We're looking at uh, specifically the dispersal phase of the spruce budworm moth. Um, so we're looking at not just the actual flight, but also uh, oviposition, uh, egg deposition events. Um, and because that affects the weight of the female um, and the timing of when she can take off uh, after uh, emerging from pupation, uh, there needs to be some time for mating uh, and then uh, she'll lay, usually lay her first complement of eggs, about half her eggs, uh, at the first uh, oviposition ov event, uh, and then she'll be light enough to actually fly uh, when the wind is up and the conditions are right. So we're uh, in this graphic that's developed from uh, Katie Marshall and Amanda Rose paper recently. Uh, we are focused very specifically on the part you see circled there, the adult phase, uh, and that is uh, the adult and laying the eggs, but not necessarily looking at the phenology of the eggs just yet. Uh, in ongoing work, we hope to actually close the entire cycle uh, and look at the rest of the seasonal biology. So, like I said, in uh, January, we published uh, a description of the model uh, that we developed. This is based primarily on Brian Sturdivant's 2013 paper that was uh, introduced in an earlier uh, presentation. Um, we took that model and expanded it, uh, transformed it into a Python object-based uh, model, which uh, represents individual spruce budworm uh, in the adult phase. Uh, and it uses a lot of work that has been done over the past couple of decades by Jacques Grenier, uh, looking at actual uh, budworm uh, physiology, uh, the response of the budworm to temperature and how that um, affects flight characteristics, um, wing beat frequency, uh, flight speed, all sorts of uh, aspects like that. We drive that model with uh, the weather research and forecasting model, which we, um, which I run uh, down to about a three kilometer resolution uh, that uses large scale weather reanalyses, topography and land cover um, to uh, dynamically downscale uh, historical time periods. Um, and so at this point, I've got about two years of 
uh, WERF model runs uh, at at least one hour resolution uh, at three kilometers covering the whole southern Quebec area. And um, we're looking right now at actual flight events in two seasons, 2013 and 2019. Um, and uh, as I'm doing that, you can see there that was part one, the model description. I am currently working on some sensitivity analyses uh, that have to do with a bunch of the uh, parameters in the flight model. So looking at how those affect flight performance and overall outcomes. Um, the WERF model is run separately uh, from the actual uh, individual based flight model. The WERF model is a high throughput computing and high performance computing uh, hybrid process uh, that I run here in Madison at the University of Wisconsin and now also uh, at the University of Texas uh, through an NSF allowance. And then also um, in working my way up to the seasonal length uh, analyses and simulations, that uses high throughput computing for a large ensemble type uh, approach, and that is a Markov chain Monte Carlo process uh, from which we can actually calculate probabilities and likelihoods for individual moths uh, and where they're laying eggs and where, they're, where the males are landing, and both of those are important to us. Uh, here's just a sample of uh, some of the weather research and forecasting model outputs. You can see there on the right for uh, July 15 to 16 of 2013. Uh, that's one of our focus events. That uh, particular event was uh, shown in detail uh, in a paper by Jan Boulanger in 2017. He had really detailed uh, radar data, and we're actually using that in our sensitivity analyses to help tune some of the parameters um, based on uh, model density of moths compared with radar uh, reflectivity observations. Uh, and then you can see there uh, the basics of what we're doing. Um, right now, I'm saving off our second grid at nine kilometer grid spacing uh, for some synoptic analyses to figure out which types of weather events are the best uh, and lead to actual flight events. Uh, and then we use the three kilometer uh, highest resolution grid for the actual flight simulations. And those are usually at a 10 minute uh, time interval. So, um, in addition to the weather, uh, we need to feed in information about when the moths actually emerge uh, from pupation. And so that, that's called eclosion. Uh, the adult dispersal uh, occurs almost nightly. Um, there are a few nights here and there that uh, weather conditions are just not right at all. But it also depends on there actually being moths available uh, to fly when the weather is good. So each night's cohort of, uh, of flying moths includes the new moths that have just eclosed, and then those that had survived any previous nights uh, in a given simulation time period. Uh, so we're gonna go from individual night simulations uh, to uh, multi-night simulations here. Um, so you can see there on the, on the bottom left, uh, the time, uh, in 2013 that's simulated by Biosim uh, and its uh, interpretation of when uh, moths were emerging in different parts of this area in southern Quebec. Uh, at the map on the right, you can see there in the map on the right that there's a, a clear gradient. Uh, earlier moths emerge uh, on the western side in near the Lac Saint Jean area. Uh, moths uh, generally emerge later over in the Cote Nord region uh, and a couple of areas farther east from there. And that actually makes a difference because the wind direction uh, in general is from west to east. So um, when the moths do fly, generally they're going from west to east or north to south or some combination of those two. 
And so it's blowing earlier moths into locations where later moths, where, where moths would be emerging later. Uh, you can also see that there's uh, about a mid-season shift in the dominance of males and females emerging. Uh, early season emergence is dominated by males. Uh, later season emergence is dominated by females, according to Biosim. Uh, and so that uh, makes a difference in getting, uh, reaching a level of uh, full mating. Uh, instead of there being an Ali effect of mating failure because there just aren't enough males um, to serve for mating all of the females that are present in a given location. So we're going to look at one night. Uh, you can see that gray line there. Uh, that's the night that uh, we've published so far that was also published by Jan in his uh, radar study paper. And then I'll show you some early results from uh, a multi-night um, sequential simulation uh, that I'm working on uh, that eventually cover the entire summer of 2013. So um, this is one of the examples that I really love to show that uh, is just one of the flight simulations um, that shows uh, flights on the night of July 15th into the morning of July 16th of 2013. Uh, you can see there that moths are taking off at the plus signs, landing at the X's, uh, and that's their general uh, flight pattern uh, according to the weather that they're given and the topography uh, and all the factors that go into it. And you can see there that males and females have very different flight capabilities, and so that leads to different flight altitudes. Males generally are lighter, and so they fly higher and generally farther. Um, and then uh, differences in flight distances. Um, and so you can see there's kind of a monomodal uh, distribution of flight distances for males uh, on that particular night. Uh, and then there's something of a trimodal distribution of flight distances for females. Uh, and so taking those into account, now again, these are based on our modeling. Uh, they're not based on, you can't sample moths densely enough to get statistics like this, uh, especially trying to find their landing locations. Um, traps are great uh, if you know exactly where the moths came from. Um, in this case, we can track an individual moth from liftoff to landing, uh, see if it survived, uh, and then calculate our statistics over millions of moths thousands of simulations uh, in order to look at variability. So we're going from individual nights like that to uh, sequential simulations over multiple nights. And so these are stochastic simulations. They use random subsets of the available moths in the region on a given night. The liftoff times vary with local conditions. They have a particular um, circadian rhythm uh, when they uh, like to take off just around sunset. Um, the weather, of course, varies a great deal, especially near the surface in the boundary layer. And so we're using ensembles of simulations to help figure out uh, what's the variability and, of course, what's the mean in that variability that we can actually um, draw some conclusions from. These go uh, over sequential uh, nightly simulations. So there's accounting for the variety of prior night results. And then there are compounding timelines as an individual moth may be selected on a given night anywhere from zero to 10 to 1,000 times. And so we need to take into account all those possible variants for a single moth um, and uh, account for all of those. Uh, and so we use something like a Bayesian likelihood updating uh, that runs through the, the, um, through the night uh, and uh, accounts from one day to the next over the entire range of the simulation ensemble. And so we get probabilistic outcomes over the mating and the dispersal and the overposition period. And so this would... Uh, Hey, Matt, just to let yes. you know, you have one minute left. Okay, so 
I'm going to, this is a, uh, these are my early results for female egg deposition. Uh, and so we're getting great results from those. That is based on a probabilistic outcome uh, accounting of all of the simulation ensembles. And then also the males play a great role in flying into new locations where females are just emerging. Uh, and so where a male lands and a female uh, is just emerging on the same day, those are the purple areas here. And you can see there's a lot of places where new males are coming in that can supplement um, the local male population and ensure that there's less mating failure uh, on a given day. And so we're going from there, um, building up a lot of results and finding a lot of cool new things that we want to look at in detail and then summarize as we develop new publications. So with that, thanks very much. Uh, if there's time for a question, I'll be glad to take any questions. Otherwise, we can wait till the end of the session. Hi, everyone. I'm Anz Subedi, a master's student in ecology at the University of Quebec. My master project is uh, supervised by Professor Miguel Montero Girona and Professor Philippe Monchon, with the uh, Professor Hubert Moran and Professor Yves Bergeron in advisory committee. My project is entitled as How Does Climate Affect the Growth During Spruce Bottom Outbreak Period, a story after the 1950s outbreak. This study insists in the context of climate change. As we all know that climate change has widespread effects on the forest ecosystem and the functioning. It also alters the disturbance raging of the forest. And when we talk about the disturbances, the boreal and temperate biome are more prone to these kinds of disturbances. And in this biome, a spruce bottom outbreak is one of the major insect disturbances. To talk about this lepidopter moth, uh, this, uh, this life cycle, its life cycle is extended in 12 months, and each of those studies are moderated or influenced by the climatic factors like temperature and precipitation. When this adult moth laid eggs in July, the first Easter larva. Uh, the second star larva undergoes the hibernation to avoid the extreme temperature of the winter. And with the beginning of spring and summer, it comes out and it starts feeding through the tree species, mostly the coniferous tree species. And during June, when the temperature becomes more warmer and suitable, it starts to defoliate in a larger extent, uh, resulting in a condition of the trees called defoliation. And at a certain point, when the defoliation extends over a large region uh, with the massive defoliation, it results in outbreak or it attains the outbreak level. Uh, the outbreak patterns of Eastern Spruce Bottom in Quebec occurs at the cycle patterns of 30 to 40 years. And if we, if we look at the graph, the more recent outbreak, that is after 1970s, are becoming shorter and more severe in comparison to the former outbreaks. From this defoliation and outbreaks, the species of trees that are affected majorly is balsam fir and secondarily white spruce and black spruce. This suggests black spruce is a secondary host for this spruce bottom. However, because of its wide distribution range and, uh, and for providing a good nutritive support, it has become a good host for spruce bottom. Not only by the spruce bottom, the growth of black spruce is also influenced by other disturbances and climate. Thus, in this context, we aim to identify like how this climate affected the growth of black spruce during spruce bottom defoliation within the boreal and northern temperate zone of Quebec. Specifically, we aim to identify the climatic variables that influence the growth of black spruce during the outbreaks of 1960s, which is after 1950s. And we hypothesize that on seasonal scale, high range of um, variation of temperature and precipitation anomalies reduce the growth of the black source for the upcoming year during our break period. On monthly scale, 
the temperature of June had more influence on the growth ring reductions than precipitation during outbreak period. This is the study area within Quebec, where we can see the distribution of house sites within different bioclimatic zones. We, com uh, we compile uh, cross-dated black spruce tree dendrochronological series from 18 different uh, dendrochronological projects that were conducted in Quebec for the past three decades. From this uh, compilation, we were able to obtain 2,500 black spruce cross-dated trees. After this, we standardized those, uh, those rings by removing all other signals except deflation and climate. And for this, we modeled the logarithm of basal area increment as a function of a log basal area and with the spline of A's using generalized additive models. And the residuals obtained from this model were used to establish the chronology for each of our sites to, to find the site level growth index. Secondly, to uh, identify, to know the level of outbreak on each of those sites, we relied on the deflation survey or the deflation map produced by the Ministry of Forest here in Quebec. From this data, we calculated the cumulative deflation for the last five years, just to account the period that is required uh, for, for seeing the growth reduction in the treatings of tree species like black spruce. So from this, we identify the site level deflation intensity for each of our sites. Thirdly, we obtained, we selected uh, climatic variables that were important both for the studies uh, of different stages of spruce borrow life cycle and the biology of black spruce. Finally, we use a software program called Biosim to interpolate the seasonal scale, uh, temperature and precipitation data for spring and summer. And on monthly scale, we interpolated these climatic variables for June, July, and August. From this data, we calculated the climate moisture index, which is the difference of precipitation and potential evapotranspiration. From this, we calculated the site-specific climatic matrix for each of the sites. After having all three categories of data, the site level growth index, site level deflation intensity, and site-specific climatic matrix, we use different statistical analysis to answer our question. We use uh, linear mixed effect models, and to select the best models, we use a CAC information criterion with backward selection approach. And for all of our models, the response variables were the logarithm of basal area increment, and predictors were uh, the random effects of sites in year uh, plus fixed effects of cumulative deflation and standardized or scale climatic variables and their interactions. This is the results of our uh, seasonal scale model where you can see different uh, uh, predictors on the y axis with their estimated effect on the x axis. Here we can see at the severe deflation level the growth of black spruce was uh, reduced by 2.7 percentage. And this effect was different depending upon the effect of different climatic variables. For instance, th this effect was reduced further by 2.1 percent with the increase in summer minimum temperature, whereas this was attenuated by 1.3 percentage with the increase in one standard deviation above average for summer maximum temperature. If we look at the graph, of logarithm of basal area increment and, and the normalized climatic variable, we can see that at the same deflation level, the growth of black spruce was uh, reduced further with the increase, uh, increase in the temperature of previous summer. Likewise, on monthly scale level, the cumulative deflation resulted in the growth reduction of black spruce by 3.3% at the severe deflation conditions. This was further reduced uh, with the increase in the, in the unit uh, of standard deviation, one standard deviation increase in June temperature and June CMI. And the effect of June temperature was higher than that of June CMI. Uh, the uh, increase in summer minimum temperature might have created a favorable window for the spruce bottom larva to come out earlier from the hibernation on the one hand and on the other hand, at the tree level, 
and this resulted in the development of three balls which provided more, more feeding or suitable condition of feeding for the sports bottom larva. This scenario increased the deflation uh, resulting in the growth reduction of black spores. However, too hot summer might have been detrimental for the survival of sports bottom larva which might have caused in the survival failure resulting in limited deflation. This must be a uh, unique uh, time when the growth was released on the black spruce rings. Uh, likely, uh, since the suitable uh, moisture is essential for the, uh, for the survival of the early star larva, which also uh, increase its survivability on one hand. On the other hand, uh, some studies suggest that the suitable pre precipitation facilitates the spread of spruce bottom, which increases the higher success over a certain region, uh, causing more deflation in an area, which resulted in the growth reduction. On monthly level, June is an important month, both on the, uh, on the bottom live spread studies and as well as the black spruce. And uh, study suggests that for one, one degree centigrade increase in the temperature, the bud frost in black spruce happens four to five days earlier uh, than the actual one. This scenario uh, helps or provided more opportunity for bottom to feed, which resulted in the loss uh, uh, in losing more foliage from black spruce trees. On the other hand, the suitable moisture uh, availability provides the good nutritive food results for the eggs, which at the end caused uh, the overwintering success for the sports bottom larva. All of, all of this situation resulted uh, 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 in the increase of deflation with the loss of growth in black spurs. Hence, uh, we concluded that during the outbreak period, the growth of black spurs was influenced by temperature and climatic moisture. Uh, and the summer period climate interfered higher than any other seasonal variable on this interaction between the climate and the level of outbreak for, of the uh, spruce bottom. And increased summer minimum temperature favored the growth, uh, sorry, favored the spruce bottom deflation by resulting or uh, causing uh, in the uh, declination of black spruce growth. Thus, the positive effect of temperature uh, to the growth might be limited if this period coincides or if this period is proximal to the larval emergence period. Our study um, uh, is expected to assess, assist in forest management for predicting different vulnerable stands within the boreal forest in the range and severity of spruce bottom outbreak. We also suggest uh, in the continuation of developing different research tools to reconstruct the model in the past uh, to make the, the different future uh, projection uh, for different class scenario in future. But uh, I would like to thank my professors and all the col uh, collaborators who supported this project. And thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, so hello everyone, I'm Clara Riss, and today I'm going to be presenting a project I've been working on with um, my supervisor, Patrick, uh, as well as Stephen Mayer at OFRI, um, that is focused on um, improving the Ontario aerial survey data um, that's affected by flight paths uh, in the current outbreaking area in north central Ontario near Timmins. So just as a quick background to the issue that we're facing, um, when they do the aerial survey of spruce budworm damage in Ontario, um, they do it in low flying aircraft and they don't exhaustively survey the entire province. So what they do is they fly along a specific flight path and map underneath that area. And then they come back around and they map underneath um, another flight path. So the distance between the flight paths is variable. It can be between four and then over to over 10 kilometers. 
So again, they come back up and they map underneath a flight path and this results in spatial gaps in the aerial survey. So the aerial survey data is very um, well mapped. It's a very good resource, but because of the spatial gaps, it means we have trouble using um, these, these maps for specific purposes. So some examples of where this is an issue is fieldwork site selection, um, biopesticide application, and uh, machine learning, which requires um, the input data to be um, very, very accurate um, without these spatial gaps. So our objective with our work is to fill in these spatial gaps um, so that we can use this data um, for a variety of purposes. So my work is focused on specifically moderate to severe defoliation um, in this north central area of Ontario. So in order to fill in these spatial gaps, um, we first started with Landsat time series analysis. So we took stacks of Landsat imagery and what we did was we looked at the trend in each pixel over time. So um, we calculated some spectral indices based on past research, um, specifically the normalized difference moisture index, the normalized burn ratio one, the modified simple ratio, and the SWIR and IR ratio. Um, and then we fit a quadratic to that time series and took the second derivative. So that's a constant value that characterizes the rate of decrease in the pixel. So the reason that we chose to fit a quadratic is because it can capture um, two different trends that we're interested in. So on the left, you see a graph that represents a pixel um, where um, the outbreak is at a certain stage. It has hit its bottom um, in spectral index values. So, um, and it has potentially begun recovery. So, so you see that increase um, in 2020. The other situation is a pixel that is, um, uh, continuing to suffer damage. It hasn't begun recovery. So we can see that the quadratic um, captures both of those scenarios. Um, and this is important because in, a, in the area, we will see both these scenarios in the same year because the uh, center of the outbreak may have begun recovery, where, whereas the outskirts may still be suffering from a different level of um, the, the outbreak and a different level of damage. So after we completed the time series analysis, um, we inputted uh, the data to a random forest model. Um, so our predictor variables were the raw spectral index values, their second derivatives um, from the Landsat time series analysis, and the year of the minimum value in the time series in each pixel. Um, so we did this in um, this area, North Central Ontario, that's currently experiencing an outbreak. Um, and we fit the parameters of the random forest model using a cross-validated grid search approach. So to train our random forest model, we ran into a little bit of an issue. We couldn't just take 30% of the data and use that, um, say, to train the random forest model. It's not going to work because we would potentially be uh, sampling false negatives from in between the flight lines. So to avoid that, we only sampled the positive observations from within the aerial survey polygons, so within that mapped area, and then we sampled the negative observations, so that's pixels that uh, are not experiencing defoliation um, from outside of a 100 kilometer buffer. So that was done in each year. So something that we looked at um, to make sure that our model was working properly are partial dependence plots. So these plots are used to assess variable weight in a model, but they're also used to evaluate the predictor response relationship um, that the model has, um, uh, has given us. So an we see an example of this on the screen. So this is the relationship between NDMI um, and moderate to severe spruce budworm defoliation. So we see that in this case, this is an example of where a model has been able to identify that a specific range of um, the NDMI value is associated with moderate to severe spruce budworm defoliation. So a higher partial de dependence value means that it is more likely that if we see that spectral index value, it is more likely to be experiencing defoliation. 
So we want these plots to make sense. If it was just a flat line across, we would say, okay, that variable is not good because the model isn't identifying a specific range of that variable that is uh, associated with defoliation. So we want these plots to make sense. So our results included maps for the time period of interest from 2014 when the outbreak began to 2020. Um, so let's just zoom in on 2020 for a moment. So we see um, a map of the study area with um, the probability of spruce budworm defoliation across that area. And there's higher probabilities concentrated in the area that is suffering from the outbreak. And something interesting we see is that in the middle of the outbreak, we see this low probability of spruce budworm defoliation. And something we were really happy with is that's the area that has begun to suffer from mortality. Um, there wasn't enough um, area affected by mortality to train the model yet, but we see that the model is actually picking up on it because it's saying, okay, that area is not associated um, with defoliation, it's actually mortality. So um, we were happy with those maps, but something we noticed is it, they were identifying areas, say up near in the north part where, okay, there's probably not defoliation in that area. That's way outside of the outbreak area, but we still see a high probability. Those areas are likely to be noise. The um, spruce budworm outbreaks are very concentrated. So what we did was we ran that those predictions through a algorithm called density-based spatial clustering for applications with noise, dbSCAN. It's a spatial clustering algorithm that's used specifically to filter out noise. So we we use this to filter out um, potential noise points. So points that suffered from a decrease in spectral index values that weren't related to um, the spruce bud budworm outbreak and possibly just by random chance that pixel um, suffered a decrease. But if it wasn't surrounded by any other pixels having a decrease in values, then we were like, okay, probably noise, that's not defoliation. But if it's surrounded by other pixels experiencing the same thing, okay, yes, that's probably defoliation. And that's what this algorithm does. So we see here that the final um, predictions don't suffer from the same flight line artifacts, um, but do pick up on defoliation in the same area as the aerial sketch data. So we also printed out the partial dependence plots from the final uh, model that we fit. And we saw that the random forest model was able to identify specific ranges in all the spectral indices associated with moderate to severe defoliation. So we see in all of the cases that there, um, there are these specific ranges that the model has picked up that we can associate with defoliation. Uh, in terms of the second derivative value, um, we were also able to identify these narrow ranges in the value that are associated with defoliation, with the exception of the modified simple ratio, um, which was not as straightforward. So in summary, um, what I presented here is um, our method to use Landsat imagery to um, fill in the aerial survey flight lines in the Ontario sketch map data. Um, so future work includes scaling up uh, the analysis to the Ontario level and expanding the time period of analysis. Uh, we're interested in uh, producing maps from 1984 to 2021 using this method. Um, um, and uh, yeah, many thanks to the other members of my lab for help with the presentation and I'm happy to take questions. Today I've talked about some work we've been doing in my lab on variation in eastern spruce budworm defoliation across trees within forest stands. Uh, and I do want to point out um, my co-authors on this. So Christian Corona is an undergraduate student who worked in my lab for a while and Abigail Leeper as well. So I'm not going to go into a lot of background about eastern spruce budworm because we're in the room of eastern spruce budworm experts, but it's a native defoliator um, in North America and it's considered one of the most destructive insects in its range and it has this very widespread distribution across much of the boreal forest with outbreaks occurring about every 30 to 50 years. Now, eastern spruce budworm um, can preferentially feed on the reproductive structures of the host tree. Um, 
particularly you know, pollen buds because they're gonna be very nutrient rich and pollen consumption can reduce that larval development time. And this figure from about now 70 years ago uh, is showing the number of egg clusters on flowering and non-flowering balsam fir trees. And you can see across four years that the flowering balsam fir trees had more egg clusters laid on them. And then for host tree survival, it could be linked to tree species. So despite that they're called uh, spruce budworm, it seems that uh, they seem to like uh, balsam fir more than white spruce um, tree size. So either smaller trees or very large and over mature trees are also more susceptible um, to mortality growth. Uh, for trees that are tending to have a higher vigor, so higher growth rates are more likely to survive. And uh, there's some connection here to, to reproduction. And altogether, these would lead to variation across the landscape. My expertise is in mast seeding, and so I'm going to introduce that a little bit, and it's the synchronous production of highly variable seed crops by a population of perennial plants. This is a time series of about 30 years of data on white spruce reproduction from up in the Yukon, and this is the mean number of cones per tree. And What you can see from this is that for most years, reproduction tends to be quite low, and then every once in a while, there's these big of boom years when of course there's gonna be lots of reproductive structures available and and in those peak reproduction years there's so many cones produced on on trees that we can detect them through satellite imagery and actually this remote sensing paper reference at the bottom is is work that um, that I did with Matt Garcia who's here too um, so here we have an old cone and then earlier stages of, of that seed cone now for mast seeding there are lots of evolutionary hypotheses about why trees should synchronously produce these really large seed crops. And one of them is seed predator satiation. So for seed consuming insects, keeping the reproduction quite low for a number of years will keep those seed predator populations down because if they were just higher in the, in the same amount every year, then those seed consumers would just increase their carrying capacity to eat everything. So keeping the seed predators down and then you satiate them when you have one of these big mass seeding events. Or it could be pollination efficiency. So higher levels of synchrony during one of these mast events will, will uh, give higher quality seeds or it could just be linked to, to weather cues. And then, as I said, during one of these mast events, there's so many seed cones on these trees, but earlier, you know, in those years, there's gonna be these highly nutritious pollen cones available that spruce budworm tend to like. So as I was saying, synchrony mass seeding is traditionally thought that there should be high synchrony among individuals within populations and even between species that have common weather cues for mass seeding and that this should be positively synchronized over very large areas. So suggesting that there are positive fitness effects for these trees of high levels of synchrony among individuals and therefore that synchrony is favored. But there's also considerable variability in mass seeding of trees. And so this is some data that I collected in Wisconsin from just showing the data from 2012 to 2018, mean number of cones per tree. So this is just the population average. And in 2013, we had a mast event with on average over 5,000 cones per tree. That, map, that graph I just showed is now the inset here. And now each line here is representing each individual tree at a couple different sites. So huge amount of variability. And what this looks like uh, during a year like this is something like this, at least in the fall, right? So there's lots of trees here with lots of brown cones that have now opened up, but some trees don't have very high levels of reproduction at all. So um, the objective of this uh, study is to assess patterns of spruce budworm defoliation and sort of tree defoliation and mortality. And I'm gonna talk about this in two parts. The first one is between species with balsam fir and white spruce, and then within species, just talking about white spruce. This work was done in the Northern Highland American Legion State Forest, which is in Northern Wisconsin, shown here in red. Uh, in 2012, I started a long-term cone count study on white spruce. In 2013, there was a mass seeding event in white spruce. In 2014, I went out and I asked, what the heck happened to a lot of my trees because a bunch of them were defoliated. Um, and then over the years, going back and seeing what was happening with these forest stands, uh, by 2019, decided to conduct some studies of spruce budworm defoliation and relate that to tree attributes. So this is what uh, part of this area looked like in 2012, lots of healthy trees. There's white spruce and balsam fir here. 
Um, in 2014, we can see that there's some levels of defoliation on some of these trees. We noticed that there were these spruce budworm uh, pupil casings on many of the trees. And by 2019, this is what the area looks like. So the first study uh, is the work that was done by Christian Corona. So he was funded through the National Science Foundation, has a research experience for undergraduates program. Um, and so we did a summer project. And on our approach here was, you know, Eastern spruce budworm feeds on these reproductive buds. And, and also has been thought to prefer balsam fir over white spruce. And so what I was sort of detecting was that white spruce trees were dying and balsam fir weren't. And so we actually quantified it. So we did what I'm calling a modified point count survey for mortality of white spruce and balsam fir, which means in multiple areas of these stands, we went stood in a spot where we could see a bunch of trees and counted the number of white spruce trees if they were alive or dead and did the same thing for balsam fir. Um, and then Christian, for a number of trees, uh, measured their DBH and also their crown class. So were they just a, a big open grown tree to something that's overtopped? And we also had some cone count data either from direct counts on white spruce or photos as I will talk about. So some of the results uh, is that only white spruce had any mortality by 2019. So we had two different sites. So one of these we're calling Dorothy Dunn or Palmer East doesn't mean anything to you, but those are the names of our two sites. Uh, white spruce balsam fir, live dead, percent dead. So Dorothy Dunn, 65% of the white spruce trees from these just visual point count surveys were dead. Um, and in the other one, it was 53%. And so these trees, you know, could be severely defoliated, might come back, but they're still not reproducing, or they're, sorry, they still have no needles on them whatsoever. And a bunch of them are now falling over. And so again, as a reminder of what this looks like, and a lot of these trees in the background here are balsam fir and, and look pretty good. Um, based on the characteristics that, that Christian collected on these, uh, we ran some AIC model selection and found out that the only difference between these, the live and dead trees, was what species they were, with the white spruce trees having mortality and not the, uh, the balsam fir. And so we were trying to think about well, why might this be happening? Well, maybe there was differences in mass seeding events. So they, white spruce and balsam fir are thought to respond to the same cues, but it's not absolute. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done in the mass seeding world on community level masting. And so what I'm proposing sort of happened is, so 2013, white spruce were masting. We have data on that. Balsam fir, this is some photos, and I have a number of them from 2014, of balsam fir trees with a lot of cones on top. They have a lot of cones on them in 2014. They could not have had lots of cones on them in 2013. That's sort of a, a well-established fact that trees do not mast two years in a row. So we found some differences in white spruce and balsam fir. And then Abby was doing her masters um, and she was just looking within white spruce. So why are some white spruce trees surviving uh, defoliation or this outbreak anyway, and other ones are not? And so again, Eastern spruce budworm feeds on these reproductive buds. Um, and even others have suggested that outbreaks can coincide with mast years. So these two trees in this photo are, are both trees that we have data on. You know, they're both about the same size and everything. And one of them uh, ended up being defoliated and the other one did not. And remember, there's this huge amount of variation in the number of um, and the amount of reproduction happening by individual trees, even within one of these mass seeding events. So we have cone count data. So we started collecting that data in 2012 um, and have data at least for 2012 and 2013 for these trees that, that underwent um, in all of these sites, even if they ended up being defoliated. Uh, and we take visual index. So use binoculars, count the number of cones on trees. Um, and we can use things like image J. So this one has thousands and thousands of cones on it. Uh, and then in 2019, we also, you know, classified the trees as either a zero if it was dead, moderate to severe defoliation, or did the tree just basically look healthy? And for today's purposes, I'm just gonna talk about these extremes. So we have trees that are either dead or trees that, you know, to the untrained eye, look pretty healthy. Um, one thing I'll note, it, note is that since 2015, we saw a 6.4% uh, increase every year in tree mortality of white spruce. Um, and one of the things that we found that was interesting, so if we go back and look at what was cone production of these trees in 2013 during that mast event, and then what was their status in 2019, 
Well, the trees that ended up being dead tended to be the ones that had higher cones per basal area. So larger trees are going to have more cones just because they're larger. So we controlled for that. Um, there are some dead trees that had quite low reproduction. And those were trees that uh, didn't die sort of right away. They died sort of later on. So there might have been, you know, close to other trees that had high amounts of budworm and then um, ended up with lots of eggs laid on them and more consumption. Um, Abby also did a lot more work. Um, and found that you know not, not only did the trees produce more cones in 2013 through some dendro work, she found that they had the dead trees had lower growth rates um, leading up to when we first noticed the defoliation, and also that those trees were taller. And so some of the some summary and implications is that we found considerable interspecific and intraspecific variation in tree mortality following the spruce budworm outbreak, and in not the way that we expected. So higher levels of defoliation in white spruce compared to balsam fir. We also found there was a survival advantage associated with low reproduction during a mass year, which is very counter to what the mass eating literature would put out there. Um, and this gives insights into the heterogeneity and tree mortality across the landscape. With that, I will just thank the spruce budworm research community. We've asked lots of people, including a number of people here, um, for advice and thoughts, and everyone has been very kind. And also uh, Christy Rollinson, who was on Abby's committee and helped out with some Dendro work. So thank you, and I'll take any questions. I just want to thank everyone for attending and for all of our speakers for giving a really great series of talks that, that showed such great um, intersections and they were very complementary. So I think the, 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 the next round of, of the next generation of budworm research is in, <laughs> is in, good, is in, in good hands.